When money ceased to be backed by gold five decades ago, our economic system began to function very differently than it had up until then. Capitalism began to evolve into creditism. One of the key elements of this transition involves international trade. Specifically, when gold was money, international trade had to balance. When gold ceased to be money, it no longer did. The importance of this change cannot be overstated. It set off the greatest global economic boom in history. It's easy to understand why trade between nations had to balance when gold was money. At that time, if a country bought more from the rest of the world than it sold to the rest of the world, it had to pay for that trade deficit with gold. If that deficit persisted for very long, that country would have run out of gold, and it would have had to stop buying things from other countries. In practice, the actual process that ensured that international trade balanced was more gradual and complex than that, but still easy to understand. It worked through what can best be described as an automatic adjustment mechanism. I'll use an example of trade between England and France in the 19th century to demonstrate how this automatic adjustment mechanism worked. If England ran a trade deficit with France, England would have had to ship some of its gold to France. That English gold would have flowed into French banks. Larger gold holdings would have allowed the French banks to extend more credit than they could previously. As credit expanded in France, credit growth would have fueled economic growth, leading to an economic boom. Soon, French industry would have been working at full capacity and there would have been full employment. Consequently, before long, prices in France would have begun to rise and there would have been high rates of inflation. The opposite would have happened in England. English banks would have lost gold and consequently would have been forced to contract credit. The contraction of credit would have caused an economic slump. Industrial capacity would have been underutilized and unemployment would have risen sharply. This would have led to falling prices and falling wages. In other words, there would have been deflation in England. Before long, the rich French would have begun buying more cheap English goods, while the unemployed English would have stopped buying so many expensive French goods, and as a result, trade would have come back into balance. That was the automatic adjustment mechanism that kept trade between nations balanced under the gold standard and under the Bretton Woods international monetary system that was put in place at the end of World War II. Understanding that process not only allows us to understand why trade used to balance, but also why economic bubbles began forming all around the world during the decades that followed the breakdown of Bretton Woods in 1971. That subject, the origin of economic bubbles, will be discussed in a separate video. After the Bretton Woods system broke down, it didn't take long for the United States to realize that it no longer had to pay for, it tra pay for its trade deficits with gold. It could pay for them with paper dollars, no longer backed by gold, or with U.S. Treasury bonds instead. In other words, it could pay with credit. Soon afterwards, the U.S. began running large and then enormous trade deficits with the rest of the world, as shown in this chart. Here it can be seen that U.S. trade was balanced from 1948 until the collapse of Bretton Woods in 1971. Soon after that, however, the U.S. trade deficits began to explode. The current account provides a more comprehensive picture of a country's overall balance of payments than does the trade deficit data alone. The next chart shows the U.S. current account balance. The data here goes back to only 1960, but the takeaway is the same. The U.S. current account was more or less in balance under the Bret Bretton Woods system, and then it wasn't. By the mid-1980s, the U.S. current account deficit exceeded 3.5% of U.S. GDP. That was unprecedented. By 2006, 
it had blown out to 6% of U.S. GDP. That was $820 billion deficit in that one year alone. The cumulative U.S. current account deficit since 1971 has been $15 trillion. That deficit transformed the world because the rest of the world received $15 trillion it would not have received had money continued to be backed by gold. When it became possible for the U.S. to, to buy seemingly limitless amounts of goods from other countries and pay for those goods with credit, it created a new set of conditions that didn't exist when trade deficits had to be settled with gold. Globalization quickly took root and flourished in this new environment. The outcome was an, an extraordinary global economic boom. One after another, the countries that ran big trade surpluses with the U.S. experienced astonishingly rapid economic growth. Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan were first, then Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia, then China, and more recently, Vietnam. As a result, hundreds of millions of people were pulled out of poverty. And China, the country with the largest trade surplus with the U.S., was essentially rebuilt, transitioning from extreme poverty into an economic superpower that is now rivaling the U.S. for global supremacy. The United States also benefited from this new international trade regime. The U.S. economy was suddenly no longer constrained by the industrial capacity of the United States itself or by the size of the U.S. workforce. Now, U.S. businesses could tap into the industrial capacity of the entire world and into a global workforce nearly 25 times larger and up to 90% cheaper than the U.S. workforce. U.S. corporations took full advantage of these new circumstances by moving their factories abroad or by simply buying what they needed from non-American companies producing in low-cost countries. As a result, corporate profits soared. Even more importantly, from a macroeconomic perspective, the price of manufactured goods began to fall. And falling goods prices pulled down the rate of inflation. Globalization drove down inflation from the early 1980s until COVID and Russia's war against Ukraine disrupted global supply chains and pushed inflation higher again. So inflation was in the double digits in 1980. It came down rapidly as the U.S. trade deficits grew. In 2009, there was deflation. In 2015, there was deflation again. And only because of COVID and the Russian war on Ukraine did prices begin to rise again. And as inflation fell, so did interest rates. The yield on the 10-year U.S. government bond fell from 15% in 1981 to 1.5% in 2016 and then to 0.6% in 2020. It's important to note that inflation and interest rates fell even as U.S. government budget deficits expanded. This chart shows that after 1971, the U.S. government's budget deficits blew out to levels that were far beyond anything that had come before. Here's the, the U.S. government budget deficit in World War I. Here it is in World War II. Then after 1971, we saw budget deficits on an entirely larger scale. By 1992, the government's budget deficit was $290 billion that year. And that's up to just 1992. Here's what happened afterwards. By 2009, the budget deficit was $1.4 trillion, and by 2020, it was $3.1 trillion. In the past, the spending associated with large budget deficits tended to overstimulate the economy and lead to high inflation. High inflation would push up interest rates since the investors buying government bonds would demand higher bond yields as compensation for higher inflation, and higher interest rates would damage the economy by deterring consumption and investment. However, when trade no longer had to balance, buying goods from low-wage countries 
drove prices, inflation, and interest rates lower despite higher government borrowing and spending. This made it possible for the U.S. government to spend more to stimulate the economy between the early 1980s, when the large U.S. trade deficits began, and 2020, when COVID disrupted global supply chains without causing inflation. To wrap up then, if money had continued to be backed by gold, international trade would have remained in balance. The global economic boom that pulled hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and turned the trade surplus countries into industrial powerhouses would not have occurred. The high rates of inflation that preceded globalization would have persisted, and the U.S. government's ability to spend huge sums on defense and social welfare simultaneously would have been impossible. And this is only the beginning of the story. An economic revolution occurred when money ceased to be backed by gold. The consequences of that revolution, both positive and negative, extend far beyond what's been discussed thus far. It's essential to understand what those consequences are to make sense of how the economy works in the 21st century. Stay tuned. This revolution and its consequences will all be thoroughly explained in the Creditism 101 videos to come.